Welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Victor Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us on the internet and also for being with us on uh, radio worldwide through the facilities of World Christian Broadcasting and for a live audience. Thank you for being with us as well. Our theme scripture for Stories of Amazing Grace comes from Romans chapter 8, 38 through 39. I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love. Not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. 4,492,185,745. That's the number of searches for pornography since the start of 2015. The porn industry in the U.S. generates $13 billion each year. And if home computers had been around in the 1950s and 60s and had, uh, had money, I probably would have contributed to that industry. Sex education was non-existent from my parents. I shared this story before that my parents were divorced before I was born. Actually, I think I was in the mother's womb during that time, their divorce. We had a somewhat dysfunctional family. The father was not around to teach me about sex. My mother did not. She had her share of emotional and mental problems and did not uh, do much in the way of instruction. I uh, told you before during a story of Amazing Grace that she had threatened to kill me twice, once by having a butcher knife in her hand standing at the foot of my bed, and another time as we were driving along the interstate um, wanting to uh, threatening to slam the car into a utility pole on the way back from the beach in New Jersey. A relative attempted to molest me three times when I was young. Didn't happen, but attempted. My sex education consisted of sneaking a read of the novel Peyton Place. <laughs> Some of you have read that. <laughs> or looking at art magazines of nude pictures, or listening to off-color jokes and coarse comments from teenagers that were older than me. And that's about the extent of my sex education during my teen years. The power of sex, the power of porn, is extremely strong. Watch this video, and then you'll meet tonight's guest. It's a stunning confession. Terry Crews detailing on his Facebook page his addiction to pornography. For years, 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 my dirty little secret was that I was addicted to pornography. Some people deny, they say, hey man, you know, you can't really be addicted to pornography. There's no way. But I'm going to tell you something. If day turns into night and you are still watching, you probably got a problem. My issue was and is with pornography is that it changes the way you think about people people become objects people become you know body parts they become things to be used rather than people to be loved
Tonight, we're going to get the facts about pornography, sexual addiction, and sexual abuse. We are fortunate to have with us Marnie Faree. She is the founder of Bethesda Workshops here in Nashville and the leader in uh, the field of sexual addiction, especially among women. She is a Christian therapist, a self-described grateful, recovering sex and love addict. And she is here to share her story. Please make welcome Marnie Faree. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, I'm honored. I think most people here know you. Uh, when you came in the door, and I had never had met you. I uh, met your father years ago, yes. Mac Wayne Craig. Mac Wayne Craig, so many of this audience does did know right. Doc, as right. I call him. And I'm grateful for that. And most of the audience, I think, thinks you came from a fairly perfect family. They might. We looked pretty perfect. But that was not the case. That was not the case. Tell me your story. Um, I'm, I'm, again, honored to tell tell you my story. My story begins the way all of our stories do, with my parents. And uh, many of these folks do know Doc. And what I know about Doc is that he was a brilliant man and a man who deeply, deeply loved God and influenced so many people, including so many in this audience, for Christ and including me. And those things are true. What's also true is that he was a deeply broken man and had his own struggles with pornography and some other issues, and they deeply impacted our family. And so that was a secret in our, in our home. Did you know that at any time? I did. Some of my earliest memories are around age five and finding stashes of pornography. So those, those images are embedded in my mind and in my brain chemistry, as the video talked about. Um, at, at this very second, those images are there. Mm. We have some pictures, I think, that you gave to us. Let's see what uh, your parents look like here. Yes, yes. There you um, go. Doc Memories and my mother called yeah. her Mama Daddy, and I believe they deeply loved each other again and deeply loved the Lord. So one of the things, Larry, I think that's important about a story of amazing grace is that it's possible for two things that seem very opposite to be true. That Doc, like many Christians who struggle with pornography, again, deeply loved the Lord and had a huge influence for Christ and was very sincere in all of that. And there was a dark side that came from woundedness, as I've come to understand his story. And both of those things are true. And so part of my story has been coming to hold in duality both of those things and acknowledging the pain and the difficulties that I experienced growing up and the sexual abuse that I experienced by one of his dearest friends and, and, and holding in tandem the pain of my childhood that many people never ever saw and had no idea about with the um, honest and good and true and, and positive that Doc uh, and the church brought me. We have a picture of your siblings. Yes, I'm the youngest of three. I was the very much wanted little girl. Doc especially wanted a little girl. So I have two older brothers, um, one around five years older and one around 10 years older. Um, and and I'm, I'm so grateful for them and for my older brothers. One of the hardest parts as well of my story is not just some of Doc's challenges and the pornography that was there and a part of our home um, and that both of my brothers also found was of my mother's story. Uh -huh. When I was about 18 months old, my mother was diagnosed with colon rectal cancer and had been struggling with that for a good while before she went to the doctor. And so I heard you talk a little bit about we don't talk about sex. Um, I can only imagine what it was like for her to be married to such a charismatic and dear and beloved person and know about these struggles. Um, and <clears throat> she died when I was about three. And so that was an enormous, enormous loss in our family. And we had no tools to process that grief. Um, I think it, it was such a different world uh, than today. My mother died in 1959 and I was three years old. So. I think for Doc, it was such a loss and to be a single dad in 1959, and there wasn't childcare and all of these just enormous challenges about that. And we spiritualized her death. You know, she's in a better place. 
which is certainly true. I think we have a picture of, of um, a slide of her funeral. Of the funeral. Uh -huh. Which is certainly true. That's not a helpful thing to tell a kid. I, I read that in your book. Or actually to tell anybody that's grieving. And why is that? What is, how does that make you feel? Um, it made me feel like no one understood the enormous pain that I was in because of that. And that I was supposed to just be happy and just go on and not feel what I feel. It gave a very clear message of we don't talk and we don't feel. So that's another, again, another paradox of our good theology in, in the Romans passage. All things can work together for good, but that doesn't give us this automatic end around the painful times. So you felt like an abandoned child. I absolutely felt like an abandoned child. That um, that here my mother had died and left me. And also in many ways, Doc was not present. Again, it was a different time. He was very much a workaholic. That term wasn't around in the 50s, 60s, and 70s either. But both because of his kind heart and his nature and his servant spirit, he poured himself out for his churches, for Lipscomb College then. But I think also as a way of medicating his own grief and medicating probably his own guilt, that pouring himself into Christian service and other people and really trying to be a helper for other people helped him somehow. But what it did for his family was that Doc was never, ever hardly home. We didn't take a family vacation. <laughs> he was not at home unless there was a throng of, of usually college kids that was hanging out at the house or he was teaching a Bible study with or something. So again, I thought, Larry, that if I was a better little girl, first that my mother wouldn't have died and left me. Because even as a three-year-old, I had the clear sense my mother was choosing to die. Hmm. And in some ways, I think, I think that's true. Um, and I especially then thought that if I was a better little girl, that my daddy would spend time with me. And I just didn't understand the challenges that he faced and, um, and that it had nothing to do with me. And so that was another part of my healing process, to come to understand that that was him and his challenges, and that he loved me deeply. And he did tell me often how much he loved me. He was very great with his words. Uh, and he would tell me that he loved me, and he would hug me. But my love language, because of the abandonment as a child, was time. I wanted someone who was going to spend time with me. This picture with my mother was taken just um, a month or two before she passed away. So she looks wonderfully healthy there. And the next shot here is uh, you as a child, and then this yes. uh, friend came into your life. That's right. Um, our you home, Doc called it, was Grand Central Station. And what he meant by that was that, that it was filled with college students. And I loved growing up in that environment. I mean, I've spoken with several of them here tonight who remember me as a little kid. And, and they... Um, they almost petted on me like the sweet puppy, you know? I, I was embraced by them and, and welcomed by them. So I grew up very much in that situation. And different ones of them were especially dear and even actually lived in our home. And when I was five, one of those college kids, he was 20, came into our home. And his parents and Doc had been very good friends for a long time. And so um, he came to live with us. And he really took me under his wing and spent time with me. And he was the first person who would let me talk. He would let me say, well, I really miss my mama. And he would say, of course you do. So he filled a gap in your life that, you, that your father didn't did. fulfill. Yeah. And I could say to him, and I miss my daddy. And what's the matter with me that he won't spend time with me? And, and he would listen. And he would listen. And he could say, Barney, that's just what preachers do in these days. And it's not about you. And I'll be a father figure for you. And he was. He taught me how to roller skate, and he taught me how to ride a bicycle, and he was very interested. At five, I was already writing. I'm sure it was fabulous, very profound poetry. And he would listen to that and thought it was wonderful. And so he filled part of this ache of abandonment inside in many, many positive ways. And he was also sexual with me. And I had no idea that that was sexual abuse. Um, I had found the pornography before he came into our home around the same time, but he very... That began at age five? At age five. But very soon he came, and he reintroduced me to pornography and all kinds of grooming activities. And I was 10, about the age of this middle picture, 
before I recognized that these activities had something to do with sex. I mean, you talk about no one talked with you about sex. I don't think Doc talked with my brothers about sex. And again, it was a different, a different age and a different time. But he for sure had no clue what to do with me in many regards, but of course to talk with me about sex. But about around age 10, all the grooming activities had reached a level that I knew this must be something about sex. Mm -hmm. And I was just not quite 16 before we had intercourse, and that was my only definition of sex. But by 16, I was grown. I mean, we were this perfect family, and here's this father who still wore his wedding ring. He was buried with his wedding ring five years ago. I mean, he still always loved my mother and always grieved for her, and we looked so perfect and we looked so wonderful, and I had so many responsibilities in his home and was such an overachiever and great student and involved in all kinds of extracurricular stuff and, and all of that, and I thought at not quite 16 that I was making a decision to be fully sexual with a man who's 15 years older than I am who began to groom me at age five. I had no idea that that, that really wasn't a decision I was making, that that was a whole process of abuse. Is there a point there that you realized this is wrong, or did you, did you have Well, to? at 16, when we finally had intercourse, I knew, of course, at that point that that's wrong. And I'm thinking, again, this is totally my fault, because, I mean, he never held a gun to my head, he never physically forced me, so I had no dynamic about all of the nuances and, and um, the imbalance of power that happens around sexual abuse. And I had no thought that one could be sexually abused by somebody that was a friend, that you trusted, in fact, that you dearly loved. I loved Larry. He was my father figure. And after Doc, What's he his was... Name? Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, but he was the most important person in my childhood after my father. I see. And so the idea that something about that could be sexual abuse literally never occurred to me till I'm 35 years old and my life is so broken and I'm entering my own healing journey. Never, ever occurred to me. Were you married during this time? Um, I married in college. Part of the challenge about all of that was I learned, first I was a very attachment wounded person, that's what that's called, the abandonment, my mother's death, not pouring himself out to everybody else and not for his family, um, that's called an attachment wound. And from that huge black hole inside, and then I learned at the hands of this sexual abuser that sex equals love, that you gave sex in order to get love. And that was this unspoken contract, the contract that I didn't realize I had signed, but that that's how it played out. And I became very promiscuous beginning in high school and continued through college. And again, that was such a secret. I'm not sure that we've got teenagers here today, this evening. I don't know that that would happen now with all the social media and all the stuff, but when that wasn't a part of the culture, it was literally somebody had to tell the secret, and surprisingly, people didn't. So on this good Christian college campus, I found that there were a whole lot of good Christian college guys who were real willing to tell me how fabulous I was if I would just be sexual with them. And I was honestly very willing to be sexual with them if they would just tell me that I was okay and I was fabulous and I was wonderful and spend a little time with me. And so I became very promiscuous, which reinforced my belief system. Frankly, my belief system by the time I got to college was I am a whore. Mm. I, I have this complete double life going on. Again, I'm an A student. I'm involved in all kinds of stuff, athletics, theater, drama, popular, all kinds of stuff, but deeply, deeply troubled inside. And almost no one knew. Um, I talked a little bit to, uh, to a few people, including one dear man here this evening who's an elder of this church, um, but certainly never telling the whole extent of the challenges that I was, was facing and the shame that I felt. At what point was it you, you, you progressed from a sexual sin to an addiction? I would say probably looking back, by the time I was 18 or so, I today would say, oh, I was a You realized blood. mentally that... I didn't have those words for it or that construct okay. for it. Again, my only thought was, I am a whore. Okay. I am a horrible person. Because at that point, I was 
a concert church camp, and I was teaching Sunday school and vacation Bible school, and I started publishing at around age 12 Christian literature for teens. So I had this thing going on that looked so perfect and fed into the perfect <laughs> formula for our family, but I had all of these secrets. And no one knew. And, you know, it actually was just like Doc. He had so much of all this stuff. And then he had these secrets that people generally were not aware of. And so that was just, that was a generational pattern in my family. Um, so I knew I was in trouble and I was overwhelmed with shame. And I thought if I got married, it would take care of the promiscuity problem. And I married in college. I was 20 years old. Um, and I thought if I just found the right Mr. Perfect, that that would take care of it. And and our marriage was in trouble pretty quickly because I had grossly unrealistic expectations about a marriage. I had never seen one. Got never remarried uh, after my mother died. And and I really thought that that now if you're married, so it's okay spiritually, religiously to be having sex, that that would take care of everything. Did you think your desire for having sex with someone outside of marriage would go away? When Absolutely. You got married? Absolutely. But it did not. And it didn't. And, and the confusing and complicating thing about that, Larry, is that it wasn't, it's not really about a desire for sex. It's about a desire to stop the ravages of shame that's inside. It's about a desire to be okay, to be affirmed, but to be acceptable, to be loved. And I married another deeply wounded person, and he didn't understand that, and I didn't understand my story, and we had no tools for a relationship. And and again, we married very young, and we were very sexual before we got married. But I just thought, you know, well, whatever, we're, we're getting married, and that's okay. But we were in trouble pretty quickly, and we divorced after we had been married not quite four years. And we didn't have any children together, and today I'm very grateful for that. But you can imagine that Ed, Doc and his emphasis in marriage and Christian home and all that kind of stuff, yeah. wow, a divorce rocked his world. It broke his heart. Mm -hmm. Broke his heart. I just thought somehow I will pick up the pieces and go on. And I did. And within nine months of getting divorced, I had met and married David. David's my current husband. We've been married 35 years, and we have two children and grandchildren, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful for that. But the challenge was I hadn't dealt with any of my stuff. And part of that was because I didn't realize how much stuff I had to deal with. I thought, I am a horrible person, and I've committed all this sexual sin, and if I can just get it together and straighten up and fly right and be a good girl and now a good wife, even though I've been divorced once and gotten remarried, and that's really horrible, you know, in our tradition, um, that then it would be okay. And I had these children, and I had a, a long period five years or so of I was totally faithful to David. I was faithful to him when we were dating. I was faithful when we married and we had these children and I really honestly thought that all this craziness was behind me and that everything would be okay. And then? And then. And then life took some really hard, hard challenges and it wasn't that David and I were fighting or, or whatever. We do life together very, very well. But challenges, we buried three family members in a year. We made a decision together to leave Florida where we lived, and David was climbing the ranks for um, Fortune 100 company, and to move back here to Nashville where we had both grown up. And, um, and he bought a small business, and we cut our income by two-thirds. And so we both began working. I went back to work. I'd stay at home with our kids. I went back to work with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, about 60 hours a week trying to get this business to survive. And then Doc's had some challenges, and some of his story became public in a very painful way for him. And that really did something to me inside that I didn't understand then. And today what I know is it opened up all of my own shame, and it opened up a lot of memories, and it opened up a lot of things. And I wanted my husband to really process and, and talk through and figure out all that with me, and he couldn't. And it wasn't because he didn't love me or he didn't want me to want to, but from his own story, which is different than mine, but he had his own brokenness and didn't know how to talk about things and how to do emotions. But it activated that abandoned, wounded child. And I felt unloved. And I went back to a pattern of coping. That's what sex 
addiction. That's what pornography is really about, largely. It is about unhealthy coping. And I began talking to a good friend who was a guy. All my friends were guys. I grew up with men. I, I didn't have many girlfriends. I mean, I grew up with 400 big brothers, <laughs> in effect. And I began. Which said in your book, I read they walked around nude going to the bathroom. They would. They would. <laughs> I mean, my brothers and the guys that lived with us, and it was just like whatever. I was one of the guys. Yeah. Um, and it began a, an emotional attachment and then an affair. And then I had another affair and another affair and another affair. And finally settled on this very intense affair with a man who was next door. Mm. And then my life began to catch up with me. My life. Um, I was diagnosed in 1990 with cervical cancer caused by sexually transmitted disease, caused by HPV. And had... Did that turn things around when that happened? It began the process. I think it was something that... <sighs> that um, got my attention enough because I found in that experience, it ultimately brought me to a very significant suicidal um, episode is not quite right. I was sitting in my kitchen floor with a bottle of pills in my hand. I couldn't figure out any other way because I continued to be sexual with this guy next door, having unprotected sex, presumably passing HPV back and forth to each other and then periodically being sexual with other people Battling cervical cancer, having three surgeries in a year for it, had all kinds of medical complications after the first one. I mean, I, my, my life and health were seriously in trouble. And it was the first time there was this thought that came to my, into my head that I believe was absolutely God and the Holy Spirit, because this was long before my, any exposure to 12-step programs or thinking. But the thought was, my life is unmanageable unmanageable. Even after this, though, you still acted out. And after this, what happened with that suicidal thing was it was the first time I dared tell the truth to anybody. Mm. And sitting in my kitchen floor that morning, I picked up the phone and I called a dear friend and I asked her help. And I said, I'm in trouble and I'm sitting here with pills and I have water and I'm really thinking about taking them. And I just want somebody to understand why. And I said, I'm in an affair, and it's not the first affair. And you know that cervical cancer? Because this suicidal episode happened in 1991. And I said, it's because I had cervical cancer. Because at that point, people didn't understand that automatic connection and put that together. So people were so nice to me. You know, oh, well, this mo sweet little mother, and she's got cervical cancer the same way her own mother had cancer, and can we bring you casseroles? Mm. And I was just like, oh my gosh, if you had any idea what's really going on with me. And I said, that's, that's the truth. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just want somebody to know. And I really thought she was going to tell me something helpful like, well, let's pray about it. Or you need to stop doing this. You know this is wrong. I mean, that, that was the only solution which I is knew. Not, which is not the answer, is it? Which is not the answer. I mean, that is the answer. But when you're an of, addict, the process, you but. can't do that by yourself. Mm -hmm. And instead, Larry, all she said was, oh, Marnie, I am so sorry. I am so sorry you're in this much pain. Promise me you won't hurt yourself because I'm, I'm hanging up and I'm getting in my car and I'm coming to you and I will get you help. And she did. And it was the first time, other than a conversation or two before when I'd never told that level of the truth, that I ever felt grace. And grace changes things. Mm -hmm. The way all the striving, the way the self-will, the way all the Bible reading and prayer and straightening up and all that kind of stuff can't possibly. And she came and she sat in my kitchen floor that day and she heard my story. And she said, I'm working with a counselor and I think she could help you. And within a week, I'm sitting in a counselor's office at the Woodmont Hills Church that at that point was one of about two dozen people in the country who had trained with this young psychologist named Dr. Patrick Carnes, who is the leader and the guru in the field of recovery of sexual addiction. And so she knew how to help me. And that began an amazing story and you got into a 12-step program. Eventually, after counseling, I got into a 12-step program and achieved what's called sobriety. There's sobriety from sexual addiction, from pornography, the same way that there is from drugs and alcohol. And in those healing rooms is where I, this daughter of an amazing preacher, that's where I found God. 
and your spouse stayed and with you during brokenness. this. And he did. And David ultimately took his own journey of recovery and, and our couple's work. And so what I know today is that God has redeemed enormous amounts of pain in my life from, from that broken marriage. And, and we were obviously, we were on the brink of divorce when I entered recovery to becoming a committed spouse and to understanding what that's, that's about from the pain of the sexual abuse that I experienced for 15 years. I, this man was a perpetrator to me from the time I was five till I got married and I was 20. And from those experiences into being um, what Henry Nowen would call a wounded healer. Um, and to, to become um, a, a missionary for women especially who are struggling with sexual addiction, with sexual abuse, to begin a ministry. So I, I have experienced so many, um, so much redemption and so many blessings from that story. Even, even sitting right here at this moment, Larry, the Larry the perpetrator, had a PhD in performance theater. And so he taught me how to speak and how to write and how to have presence and how to do these kinds of things and how to speak and teach across this country to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He taught me how to do that. And so I think about what he intended for harm, God has used for good. Mm -hmm. So in so many ways, with the pain of my father, I got to be a daughter who could love my father well, who we were able to rebuild a relationship at the level of which he was capable, which wasn't that deep emotional level, but was kind and so dear. And I got, along with my brothers, to care for him through the ravages of Alzheimer's in the last part of his life. I got this wounded, abandoned child. I got to be a mom, a mom to two amazing, now young adults. They're both married. I'm a grand Marnie. We have two fabulous grandchildren. It's the best thing ever. It's your reward for not killing your children. It's, it's just so fabulous. And I get to be, um, I get to be that wounded healer who gets to do things like this and who gets to teach and write and direct a ministry around sexual recovery. One of the ways you've helped other people is through this book entitled No Stones, Women Redeemed from Sexual Addiction. There are some copies out in the lobby if you uh, care to purchase one uh, after, we're, after we're done here. Uh, I found, found it fascinating. Oh, <laughs> I'm a man thank reading you. Thank you. But, uh, I, I You're not a woman it. who's sexually addicted, so it. that's quite a compliment if you found that helpful. <laughs> I can see I can see myself in there sometimes. I thought, whoa. Well, but see, that's, <laughs> put that down. that's because it's not just about sexual addiction. It's about healthy families. It's about spirituality and not religion. It's about how all of us in different ways are wounded, and we're all coping in different ways. And I coped through affairs and promiscuity in that form. But you mentioned it in your introduction. I am so grateful that my recovery was before all the advent of internet and all the availability, the, the technology that's in this room right this second, that anybody right this second in probably 30 seconds could access unbelievable amounts of pornography. A mile from this building down the street is a, a, what they call uh, an adult toy box. I, I but every, every, that. Jenna, every, if I'm every home has thinking, their own right? adult toy box and it's Absolutely. called a computer. Well, everybody, in, it's not in my pocket at the moment, but in the pockets of, I bet, all the couple hundred people in this audience is a smartphone. And, and that, that's your ticket. That is the window into unbelievable amounts of material that has even an entirely different and accelerated impact from those old print magazines and books that influence Let's me. talk about sexual addiction. And uh, Will, if you play this video, they kind of introduce this segment. Okay, great. Studies show that seven out of 10 teens have been accidentally exposed to pornography online. Boys are more likely to view it, but yes, girls get hooked too, like Brianne Saldivar of Austin, Texas. 
I started to isolate myself because I hated what I was doing. I hated that I couldn't stop. Brienne is now 22, but remembers how she was addicted during all of her high school years. I would say that this is something that um, was not just me. I, I knew tons of students who were in my grade, my peers, who were struggling with the same thing. But I think the everyday teen is not educated enough to know it's an addiction, and that's how they end up getting hooked and addicted. How do you define sexual addiction? Sexual addiction is defined like any addiction which is, there's some things to look for. Um, is it obsessive? Meaning it becomes the organizing principle of life. And um, that, that's, that's what our smartphones have done for us. But the person who is looking at pornography or engaging in other forms of acting out, for me it was affairs. If that's your focus, and it, it felt to me like there was a little bird always sitting on my shoulder talking to me about it. Obsession, compulsion. I keep doing what I don't want to do despite my best efforts to stop. That's addictive. That's the, the clearest part of an addiction. So I, I didn't really want, I mean, I didn't want to have affairs because they cost me a lot in terms of shame. And I couldn't stop. So I had gone beyond the point of just sexual sin to an addict and then continuing despite negative consequences. It's like, this isn't working for you. So... Why do you keep doing this? And in a sense, it's a drug. You have a, it is absolutely a graphic a drug. here that I call that your favorite graphic. I think you. Uh, it, it, it is one of my favorite graphics. The internet has been an absolute game changer. It's the crack cocaine for sex addiction. It is anonymous and accessible and affordable, but the internet is now supercharged. And one of the challenges is that what's available online is, is not Doc's pornography or my pornography, there is unbelievable, and the vast majority of it is very violent content. And that's what, I'm looking here at some fabulous looking teenagers, that is what is telling those young men and young women is the norm. All the objectification, all of the, all the power, all of the guys take, and that's what guys are supposed to do, but girls are supposed to give, and that's what girls do. We're and, desensitized, are we? And by, we're by movies totally and... desensitized, but, but the violent nature, the, the ongoing novelty that's available online, mm. supercharges, mm -hmm. and there's even something neurobiologically very different in accessing um, via devices where you can manipulate what's happening on the screen and the print stuff that Doc's generation and my generation grew up. It's an entirely different neurofeedback loop that is unbelievably addictive. Mm. Here's some st statistics, porn facts. You say that easier, I guess. Christian men 18 to 30 years of age, 77% looked at porn at least monthly. I think we had this, this graphic here, number 16, Will. Young adults seek out porn more than any other age. Uh, it goes through all the ages, but there seems to be young adults. Among those who identify themselves as born again Christians, I guess we can clear ourselves into that, 95% admit they have viewed pornography, 54% look at pornography at least once a month, one out of three women watch at least Absolutely. once a month. Now, you wouldn't think that women, you, I, I'd heard that men like to see naked women, but women like to read romance novels. And that used to be true. In my acting out days, that was true. That is not true anymore. Really? And even the statistic that one in three women looks at pornography once a month, one in three women is addicted to pornography and looks at it multiple times a day. Really? Um, the, the impact of, of, again, all the Internet-based um, activities, all the, the current generation that are the tech natives, I mean, they're, you're growing up with it. You know, my three-year-old grandson knows how to flip the iPad to get the, the match the elephant games that he has on there. That's what I mean by tech natives. That is literally rewiring people's brains. And the, uh, for, for females, including the young generation, they are also accessing pornography and at, at almost the same rate today as males are. They're, the difference in the two genders has almost disappeared. Let's take a look at the graphic number 17. Will, this is uh, very surprising to me. 
teens and young, young adults think not recycling is worse than viewing porn. Yeah, a Barner Research study published uh, Josh McDowell Ministries in April 2006. And, and to be fair, it was looking at what has the greatest impact on society. And, you know, they're really into recycling, which I certainly affirm. <laughs> affirm. But, but so what that tells us is that as pornography has become more available, it's also become more accepted. <laughs> Shifting gears. Okay. Let's talk about the word we never talk about. Masturbation. Yeah, there you go. You said it. I, I took you off the hook. Thank you. You're welcome. How common is masturbation? Oh. And, and, uh, How common is breathing? <laughs> and is it wrong? No. The disclaimer, Marnie's opinion, clinical opinions informed by a very, um, our kind of conservative theology around sexuality um, but the and has not been run by the Madison elders or you or anybody so I've let all of y'all off the hook all right maybe the last story amazing grace we're doing it, or certainly the last time I'm invited you know whatever so I've got my one shot so I'm gonna take it so y'all hang on okay here we go no um, God made our bodies so amazing and sexual arousal is an automatic response like breathing a human being has zero control over sexual arousal, over sexual arousal. It's what the body does. If when you hit the reflex at the right spot on your knee, your leg goes up. It, it is an automatic, automatic nervous system response. So you add how God made our bodies and you add all of the sexual saturation of our culture, people are unconsciously aroused all the time. And what are they gonna do with that? So. It is absolutely normal for children, for teens, as they're trying to figure out all the sexuality stuff to explore their own bodies and to feel, find out, you know what? That feels real good. That's because God made it that way. And I don't believe there's anything wrong with that. I think it's something we need to talk about in our churches and kids need to talk to their parents. Um, um, and parents, I said that wrong. Parents need to talk to their kids about it so that they tell the our little three-year-old grandson when they come in and they find him touching himself because you know what masturbation is the first self-soothing mechanism available to the human person self-soothing ah oh, this helps me relax this feels this feels good and at three that's not about orgasm it's just about that's that's one of the things that that does and so to say that's really normal and that feels really good right yeah well god made your body that way and you don't do that in public and you know start just normalizing and talking with them about that. Here's where it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem first when it's paired with pornography. And let's be honest, all of these porn statistics that you've brought and, and the Your Brain on Porn, Gary Wilson website, and these great resources that you're introducing this audience to, people aren't just looking at pornography. They're not just looking at it. This is highly arousing material. And the natural response is, I want to get some release and, and enjoy this arousal. People are masturbating to the pornography, and that's beginning when it's becoming a problem. Because there are all kinds of things how masturbation can become a significant problem. Number one, it can become a problem when it's compulsive. I mean, we work with people at Bethesda Workshops, men and women alike, who are getting fired from their jobs because they are leaving their work area multiple times a day to go masturbate. That's a problem. It becomes a problem in that... And, and lust is always a problem. And, and lust is a problem. It becomes a problem within a um, marriage relationship because healthy sexuality in marriage, or frankly just healthy sexual response in marriage, doesn't work like masturbation. It's a whole different thing to be in a, in a coupled relationship and being sexual with somebody else, even just, and we're not going to take a breath, we're not going to get specific here or inappropriate here, but the body's response to self-stimulation is different from the body's response to partnered sex. That's just how it works. And to be honest, it's not as good. Now, there are so many benefits to marital sex that are completely different, but I'm just talking about the physiology of it. Mm. And so if Isn't a, that hard to separate, though, the physiology from the lust part? Mm, I'm, I, don't, 
I don't know. It it is if you're if your steady dis- diet is of pornography, and it's fueling all of your lust. But so we have a whole generation of young people who are growing up on this steady diet of masturbation. I mean, I'm talking daily, uh, multiple times a day, that kind of thing, and they're in, adding in pornography, and they're getting married, and they're finding all kinds of sexual problems within marriage because they've trained their body to respond a certain way, and that doesn't happen within a partnered sexual relationship. And so it takes all that supercharged Internet stuff for male sexual response to happen, for female sexual response to happen, and they're like, this was I was supposed to wait for this. This isn't nearly as good as all this pr- masturbation by myself and all this pornography, and that's what I'm expecting. I have been gypped. Why did God make us that way? Why did God make so us so sexual, so young, but married later? Well, that's a that's a cultural thing. I mean, God God made us sexual and to have um, puberty happen and all that kind of stuff. But culturally, people were getting married about puberty around puberty, around 13, 14. And our culture today, we don't get married till a whole lot later. So, so now our culture has created a problem. I'm not sure we can put that one on God. Mm. You know? I, I really think God made us the way God made us. And, and with a, a creation awesome in human sexuality and within a loving marriage relationship where a man and woman deeply love each other and it is as intimate and emotional and spiritual experience as it is a physical. That's what God designed. But look what our world has done with it. Pornography, lust, objectification, the power and control and manipulation that Satan has introduced around sex in our culture. What do you say to teens? Uh, I hear this is the case that many teens are putting off becoming a Christian until they conquer Masturbation. Oh, that just my masturbation breaks my heart. You know, again, this might be kind of radical theology for around here, but God doesn't expect us to have it all together before we accept God. That is not how this works. But you know what? That's what I thought, and I think that's unconsciously what was taught. God says, come to me. Accept my love. Accept Christ. You don't have to get your stuff together. In fact, you don't ever have to get your stuff together together because you know what we can't ever get all of our stuff together and you don't have to and it doesn't one iota change God's love for us so God's saying I don't care what your problem is and what your problems continue to be you come be in relationship with me and you come be in relationship with Jesus and that changes things what do you say to teens as a result of a president several years ago you had an affair in the office, oh, in the Oval Office. What do you say to teens who say, I don't have intercourse with my girlfriend, we have oral sex, and that's okay? Because the president said, I have not had sex with this person. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I said so many times, I have not had sex with this person, mm-hmm. so I'm fine, thank you. And I'm wading into it again, but I'm just going to say, and we not only have a president who said, I have not had sex with that person, but we have a president-elect who has objectified women, who has groped women. This is an equal opportunity mess up here that we have culturally. And what I would would say to them is, again, one of the best things and the most redemptive things, Larry, that my journey has taught me, this is a little bit of detour, but hang in here with me, Mm -hmm. is to move from a rules-based religion to a relationship-based spirituality. And I can't describe what a paradigm shift that is and what an absolute life game changer that is. So when we're talking about is oral sex sex, number one answer is yes, yes. You're not a virgin because you um, have only not had intercourse. There, th- th- that's, that's the rules base. Can I do this? Can I do this with my body? Can I do this with somebody else's body? Can I do this with our bodies? That's not the right issue. That is that rules-based religion, and it will always fail. And it's the wrong question. The question is, I want a relationship-based spirituality with God of the universe and the Christ that he gave for our salvation and for our redemption. And when you look at it like that, then the emotional affairs that I had, 
because I had tons of physical and sexual affairs, but I had more emotional affairs, they are just every bit as wrong. Because within the relationship of what should have been going to my husband, in terms of the emotional, spiritual kinds of connections, I was given to somebody else. And that is just as wrong as the physical and sexual affairs that I had. So what we need to be teaching our teenagers and what we need to be teaching most of us because as adults we don't get it and that's why we can't teach them is let's not focus on are you doing this or that and how bad is all of that. Let's focus on what's God's plan for healthy relationships? What's God's plan for integrity for you as a person? And so it's not just about when looking at pornography is wrong and that's a sin and compulsive masturbation is wrong and that's not good for you, though I believe those things, that they're sinful and they're not good for you. But let's, again, let's ask the right questions. What does God want you to be? as a person of integrity, as a person of authenticity, as a person of emotional health and present, who knows how to be okay with somebody else. What does God want to do with your shame? Do you have any advice for singles? Those same struggle, kinds of things. struggle with sexual desires. Th those same kinds of things. Again, um, God made our bodies to respond sexually. And, and for a single person, that may be an acceptable occasional sexual release. God made our bodies to do that. But you couple it with pornography, you couple it with lust, you couple it with fantasy about all these other persons, then you're in a whole other world that dishonors them as well as you. And that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing. We're going to run a, few, a couple minutes over here, but um, why don't you talk about intimacy a little bit ah. compared to sexual addiction? And and. Comment. Healthy intimacy is the solution for sexual addiction. It's the solution of the problem of pornography. Now, one of the deals with pornography is that it's so supercharged and whatever that we've got a whole generation of really good kids who are coming from really good families who don't have these deep problems and secrets, who are getting hooked because it's a brain thing. But the real solution of what God is calling us to is into intimacy. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about that healthy intimacy. It's happening right now. It's happening with this audience. I can feel it. They are with us. They're with us, aren't they? They're with us. Aren't you with me? Aren't you with us? You might be a little bit horrified, but you, you, it's the, okay. You, we, we're about through. The M word got their attention. It did. I don't love that. <laughs> I love being in churches and talking about masturbation. It's just, it's just fabulous. But healthy intimacy is somebody who is okay with themselves. They are not driven by shame. They are not coping in unhealthy ways with this big black hole inside. They are in community. We need healthy community. God intended for church to be a healthy 12-step group where people don't have to carry these secrets. They can be real. They can talk about these things. Um, but where we, we don't. Have, but but we, we don't. But you are now. Yes. Right here. Right here. So, um, and that's the solution of creating within this youth group needs to be talking. I don't know who your youth minister is, but he or she needs to be talking like every week about healthy relationships, about masturbation, about pornography, about healthy dating, about all the yeah, yeah between friends and all the turf stuff and all that stuff. That's the beginning point. We applaud those who are recovering alcoholics more we than do. we do recovering sex addicts. Of don't course. We? Because would, would, you or any of this audience, it's always kind of fun to me when people say, well, what's a sex addict really like? And I go, well, she's kind of like this. <laughs> you know, who, who would have thought? Yeah. And, and so there is still so much shame involved. And to be honest, our church has only exacerbated and added to that shame. Because the reality is we think sexual stuff is worse than just about any other stuff. We do. That's the message. Tell me about Bethesda Workshop and some Bethesda solutions workshops. here. Bethesda Workshops. I think there's a graphic uh, for Bethesda Workshops. We are based here in Nashville. Um, we have just moved into our own facility after 20 years of ministry. I'm super excited about that. We're right down the road uh, off Elm Hill Pike. It is a Christ-centered, so overtly Christian, but grace-based, non-denominational, non-evangelical um, <coughs> grace-based but clinical intensive program just four days around healing from sexual addiction in all of its forms, whether it's pornography, whether it's the compulsive affairs, whether it's masturbation, whether it's anonymous sex with same-sex people in the park, 
down the road. Mm. Whatever the form is, uh, it is just a four-day intensive that is exposing one to all of the roots, the underlying, the attachment, the abandonment, the shame, all of those things that are the engine driving this, and giving people very specific tools around 12-step recovery, around counseling, around those kinds of things, but deeply connecting people. It is, it is totally a group experience. So probably one of the most beautiful things about Bethesda workshops is somebody leaves deeply connected with at least six other people that they can call at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, well, it happened again or I'm crawling out of my skin, or I'm overwhelmed with shame, or whatever. Accountability partner, in a sense. It's accountability, but it's so much more than that. It is intimacy. Okay. It is connection. Connection is the antidote to our sexualized society. Healthy connection. Thank you for being with us. I'm Thank honored. you very much. I'm so honored. Thank you. I wanted to read uh, a couple of scriptures that you had on your PowerPoint presentation and use this as our, as our closing prayer Thank you. this evening. Oh. Let's pray. This is from Psalms and also 2 Corinthians. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Praise be to God, the Father of compassion, and the Lord of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort others with comfort we ourselves have received from God. Thank you, Father, for Marnie. Thank you for her influence and her willingness to share a very sensitive story with others to help them in their sexual addiction. Bless her as she continues to uh, work with Bethesda Workshop and as she travels around the country doing seminars and speaking engagements like this to reach others. We pray for us, Father, help us in our desire, in our desire to serve you and to, to be your witness and help us to be open to admit that we have problems as well. And we need your help daily. We pray through your son. Amen. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Marie. Thank you all. You're a fabulous audience. Thank you.